April 13, 1987, I found 12 nautiloids on a ledge in eastern Grand Canyon. And that started a, a, uh, a venture in my life that caused me to be called Squid Man, okay? <laughs> and uh, in that one layer, seven feet thick, throughout the Grand Canyon, all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada, I have found nautiloids, thousands of nautiloids. There are perhaps billions of them out there. I've drawn pictures of a thousand. And um, they're not very uh, hard to find if you know what layer to look in. And that's what I got good at. But uh, this is interesting. The uh, nautiloid fossils are kind of cone-shaped cr uh, in cross-section. They taper about one to seven ratio, and they have, uh, they have the curved uh, septa that make in the internal chambers of the shell. This is very similar to a uh, modern nautilus, the modern nautilus, which is a similar creature, but it's not coiled. This is uncoiled and about 10 times the size. So these are big animals, fast-moving predators of some type. And uh, they're, they're abundant in that one layer. I have seen more large nautiloids than anyone else on Earth. Okay, I've probably seen more nautil large nautiloids than everybody else combined on Earth. Okay, and they're in that layer. You see the middle of that layer? And you can see coral head, and you can see all kinds of things. Well, anyway, in there is where uh, I found all these nautiloids. Uh, I talked to the North American nautiloid specialist, and um, and it is kind of unusual to find nautiloids, and so here's, here's how we found it. We've, I've been experimenting and thinking about how the nautiloid bed was buried, because remember that challenge that geologist told me there's millions of years in layers of limestone? Well, that red wall limestone layer, the, the nautiloid bed, needs to be explained. And so I started thinking about laboratory flume experiments where uh, slurry flows were launched in tanks. And these uh, gravity-driven um, surges of a slurry in tanks fascinated me. And I was thinking about that. I was playing with uh, sand in a sandbox in Harry Griffin Park um, in February, February 3rd, uh, 2000, with my boys. We were throwing sand, and uh, an idea or a model came to my mind. And I've been testing that idea about how the nautiloids were buried. And uh, here you see my map over there at point one in the eastern Grand Canyon, uh, Marble Canyon. I found my first nautiloid, and I found them all the way out to Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, the bed goes farther than that. It terminates by thickening and becoming uh, laminar embedded. Okay, well, strata can form rapidly. And I believe rapid strata formation is uh, the general characteristic. Because of flume experiments, because of these natural laboratories like Mount St. Helens, we have, a, we have a spectacular argument for rapid accumulation of strata. In fact, uh, I would challenge an evolutionist, show me a strata which must be deposited very slowly, because I've been uh, doing that for a long time, and I haven't found one. And I'm, but I'm open to, to find those kind of things. I've done studies of coal beds. I've studied limestone, I've studied sandstone, I've studied uh, shale and, and mudstone rocks. So I'm ready to uh, uh, take on uh, evolutionary speculation about millions of years in strata. Okay, well, let's talk about tectonics. You know, the, the, the theory of plate tectonics uh, has uh, some very interesting roots. Now, you may have heard about plate tectonics, the idea that, uh, that the earth shifting process has occurred by horizontal divergence of great slabs of the earth. But do you know of the creationist roots of plate tectonics? Plate tectonics was validly published by Antonio Snyder in the year 1859. And uh, he, he published the configuration of the pre-flood continent, there you see it on the left, before the flood, he believed the continent split apart like you see there on his diagram from his book and it formed the present distribution of the continents. The, um, Antonio Snyder lived in uh, Ohio. He spoke English and he was a, a, a resident, a uh, United States citizen. He couldn't find an English publisher so he published in French, in France. His book is called La Creation et ses Mysteries de Voliers. The creation and its mysteries revealed. 
and he validly published plate tectonics, 1859. But problem, it was in terms of a global flood. And what was happening in the year 1859? Geologists were saying, and everybody wanted a naturalistic explanation, and we thought, uh, uh, and so Darwin was ready to ascend, and so apologetics and plate tectonics were uh, shoved under the rug and uh, ignored. The book by Antonio Snyder was gathering dust for 50 years until Alfred Wegener, a German meteorologist working on uh, Greenland, uh, dusted it off. And he took the ideas of Antonio Snyder, what I call continental sprint, okay, continental sprint, uh, the theory uh, during the flood, and he slowed it down and he made continental drift, okay, and that was uh, Alfred Wegener's uh, contribution. And when, when continental drift was proposed, uh, because a meteorologist proposed it, it was a, immediately uh, vilified and ignored. And I remember going to the University of Washington in 1966 and hearing rebuttals against plate tectonics and against uh, Alfred Wegener. What happened? During that four or five year period, I was at the University of Washington between 1966 and 1970, right in there, there was a, a revolution in the way geologists thought about plate tectonics because of the mid-ocean ridge mountain range and geologists started thinking about catastrophe or thinking about plate tectonics. They resurrected plate tectonics and continental drift, but they didn't go back to the theory of continental sprint of Alfred. Uh, they went to, uh, and they didn't go to Alf Antonio Snyder. Well, this has been simulated on a computer, and uh, one of the uh, some of the big computers have been used, and Dr. John Baumgartner, now uh, uh, formerly of the uh, uh, of Los Alamos Lab, uh, did these simulations, and he simulated plate tectonics catastrophically, and he, he believed that ocean floor was subducted on, around the Pacific Basin, and as a result of the subduction or fall of the ocean floor around the margin of the Pacific Basin, the Pacific Basin was swallowed up as continents moved, uh, diverged away uh, from Africa and uh, formed this. And uh, in these computer models, um, in 60 days into the experiment, you can see what the distribution of continents looks like and elevations, uh, topographic height and things. Mounts, uh, and, and so these simulations help us understand the tectonics of Grand Canyon, including the upwarp of the, of the Colorado Plateau, a mile and a half above sea level, a quarter million square miles. So it's very important that we think about tectonics. Now, when the plateau in the western United States was elevated, what happened? The flood waters retreated off the plateau and beveled it off. And then later it was arched to make uh, and, and flexed, like you see here. See the bent strata? And that bending, uh, that's called laramide orogeny, that bent the strata of the Grand Canyon and the eastern Grand Canyon, made a natural topographic barrier, uh, and, but it left uh, this tectonic imprint, folding a strata. And we see giant boulders in the uh, strata layers. So we know that breaking and faulting of rock was occurring in a massive way. This is the lowest flat-lying layer in the bottom of Grand Canyon. There's a man for scale in the bottom kind of right, and you see a, to the, uh, up uh, uh, from him and to the left, you see a 20-foot diameter boulder, a 200-ton boulder, okay, in a, in a bed of giant boulders. And so boulders are everywhere and argue for catastrophic uh, tectonics. So the S stands for what? Strata. The T stands for tectonics. And then what does the E stand for? The first E stands for erosion. So you look around you, and what do you see? Okay, you see the strata, you see the uplifted plateau in northern Arizona, and then what do you see? You see a canyon. And so the canyon was eroded through the strata after the tectonic warping, so strata tectonics erosion. And what do you see? Uh, you see these marvelous canyons around. Did the Colorado River erode Grand Canyon? Well, Mount St. Helens provides a miniature laboratory for understanding how catastrophic process erodes rock. And, um, very interesting uh, things to see at Mount St. Helens. Next uh, Saturday, I'm leading a field trip of geologists out there. March 19, 1982 was the mud flow. This mud flow 
was severe because in the crater at Mount St. Helens, there was about 15 feet of snow. And when the, the summit erupted, it melted the snow very rapidly in the crater, and it created this mud flow. And this mud flow went down. Uh, part of it went into Spirit Lake Basin. M uh, most of it went down to the west, down the north fork of the Tootle River. And it cut this canyon system. And here you see uh, Lewitt Canyon. You see a small waterfall coming in from the upper left. And then you see the stream going through the picture down to the bottom right. And uh, it looks like that stream eroded that canyon very slowly, doesn't it? You can imagine, uh, you know, how many millions of years it might have taken. Okay, but we know the mud flows after the summer of 1980 eroded out Lewitt Canyon. And it eroded through that solid basalt and ancient uh, volcanic ash layer. The, the lava flows about 400 or 500 years old there. That was gouged out after the summer of 1980. Big hard rock canyons were formed. And then down on the North Fork of the Toodle River, there was a large debris avalanche deposit up to 600 feet deep. And that was breached by the mud flow on March 19, 1982. And it created a breach dam, essentially. And the breach dam has a series of drainages that come together in this area. And this big giant breaching event occurred and it caused a whole new drainage pattern to be developed. March 19, 1982, the, the landslide debris was breached by that mud. That mud spilled over. It cut back a waterfall, and it left uh, through the center of the picture here a little Grand Canyon, a miniature Grand Canyon, 140 scale model. There's gully-headed side canyons, cup-shaped side canyons. There's a flat plateau north and south. There's a snaky path, and uh, if you look at it, uh, as I did back in 1983 when I, when I ventured into that area, I thought, Little Grand Canyon. I just got a paper peer-reviewed, published uh, by the U uh, uh, Geological Society of America, peer-reviewed by the U.S. Geological Survey, and it uses the word Little Grand Canyon. Okay, uh, they don't seem to mind <laughs> calling that a Little Grand Canyon. Well, anyway, it, it is. It's a, an amazing thing, a uh, 140 scale uh, model. Anyway, the breaching uh, and the erosion occurred catastrophically, and that's what I want to point out, is the Earth shows this kind of thing. Like the Grand Canyon shows evidence of that there was once a lake to the east of the Upwarp Plateau. That uh, reddish-colored, uh, darker area in the middle of the picture, that's the, the forest-covered uh, part of the plateau over six to, to 9,000 feet above sea level. Off to the east, it's only 5,000 feet above sea level. It's painted desert. And in that painted desert area in northeastern Arizona is where we see evidence of Hopi Lake. There was a lake 500 uh, cubic miles of water over there and the lake at about 6,000 feet elevation. So we have a smoking gun at a scene of a crime. We have evidence of a lake. They're up against the, the up warp strata of the Grand Canyon, the tectonic up warp. Okay, so there you see uh, see the uh, Kaibab up warp in northern Arizona, and you can see Hopi Lake there uh, in the Painted Desert at about 6,000 feet elevation. Then you can see a giant lake, or what I, what I call Canyonlands Lake in the Utah, uh, especially in Utah, Arizona, Utah, uh, New Mexico, and Colorado. And then over north of the Book Cliffs is Vernal Lake, in the Vernal area uh, in Utah, uh, north of the Book Cliffs, south of the Uinta Mountains. On the north side of the Uinta Mountains, there's Flaming Gorge. There's probably a fourth res a lake up there, too. So there, apparently, there was a series of lakes that existed on the Colorado Plateau after the floodwaters retreated, and uh, these dams breached and made this very unusual terrain. Okay, the V stands for volcanoes. Okay, so you want to think about volcanoes as you look at the Earth. For example, you look at the block diagram, and you can see evidence of magma moving around in the Earth. Down in the lower strata there, you see some black uh, dikes and sills. And then you see the Cardenas basalt. And then on the rim of Grand Canyon, there are some lava flows in Eurinkrit Plateau, North Rim. Lava spilled into the canyon. They spilled over the rim into the canyon. So lavas have been uh, active. And so after the strata, after the tectonics, after the major part of the erosion, volcanoes spilled into the canyon, didn't they? Volcanic lava flows.
So volcanoes fit in there. <clears throat> and uh, one of the most amazing of these volcanic deposits is the Morrison Formation on the Colorado Plateau. The Morrison Formation uh, uh, covers a huge area, um, even wider than the Colorado Plateau. Anyway, the Morrison Formation is the formation that contains the major dinosaur fossils. And uh, the, here you see the quarry sandstone, which is in this uh, diagonally tilted, uh, upwarped uh, strata. So tectonics is, has, have warped these strata. And then you see the erosion, and then um, you see this quarry sandstone, and that's the visitor center at Dinosaur National Monument. In the middle of the brushy basin member, 470 feet thick, is where there's a mud flow deposit with all these dino, dinosaur fossils. 1,500 dinosaur fossils on the, uh, on, the, on the quarry sandstone face there at the, the visitor center at Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, shredded dinosaur carcasses, but ligaments and muscles were still intact. Uh, the, so what does it say about dinosaur burial? It says, uh, it, says it was something violent, and uh, they, they aren't badly uh, uh, um, degraded, uh, because the ligaments and muscles were still intact, because you see articulated skeletal pieces, but uh, ripped uh, up in many, many cases. And then, uh, what is the most abundant fossil on the quarry face at Dinosaur National Monument? The answer is clams. Okay, there's more clam fossils in there than there are dino fossils. And uh, the clams and dinosaurs? What, what did dinos eat? There's hardly any wood or any vegetation there. Did they eat clams? Okay, well, something mixed that whole thing up. And what's it doing in a volcanic ash layer 470 feet thick over a wide area? It looks like there's a super volcano out there that exploded. And so Yellowstone reminds us of super volcanoes. The Yellowstone area is a giant collapsed volcano about 3,000 times the size of Mount St. Helens is the, the big eruption at Yellowstone. When that volcano exploded, it unzipped in a circle and heaved up a huge curtain of volcanic debris, which became uh, pyroclastic flows. Then the whole volcano collapsed into the hole, leaving uh, Yellowstone and the depression there. Well, uh, the, v, the V stands for volcanoes, and then the E. The E stands for what? Exponential decline, that second E. And so in the biblical framework, here's what you see. You see the power of geologic process with time. Okay, during the first three days of creation week, the process and power displayed was enormous. And you, you might remember what happened on day three. God caused the waters to be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And then ocean basins and continents were formed on day three. And then what happened? Plants were uh, uh, created on that landscape, fully formed at the end of day three. So first three days of creation, rapid, uh, high power process. Then what happened? Uh, the power of geologic process diminished remarkably with time. Uh, initially, God caused the, found, the foundations of the earth to be settled, the scripture says. And then uh, probably angels saw it. Uh, the tectonic events on day three of creation week were probably the most uh, important uh, tectonic period in, in the history of the planet. And then, uh, of course, Noah's flood. Noah's flood was a high-powered event. And on the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So in one day, there was a general upheaval, probably a, a upheaval on the ocean floor, probably associated with subduction of the of Pacific plate underneath the margin of North America. Right here in uh, the Puget Sound area, the Pacific plate was shoved under western Washington. As that happened, it unleashed a global flood on our planet. And uh, the flood uh, was, was there, and a year-long flood. Now, the power of geologic process has been declining with time. Okay, and so we live in the, uh, the aftermath of this great tectonic epoch not very long ago. So the declining power of geologic process with time. And you see the years after the flood, and you see this idea of exponential decline. That's the idea. Uh, process 
uh, has, has been declining with time. The strata forming process has been declining with time, the, 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 the rate at which strata form. The uh, tectonic process has been declining with time. I can prove to you using uh, earthquake data that over the 20th century there's a slight decli decline in the frequency and intensity of large earthquakes with time. So uh, declining earthquake power with time, that's evident in the earthquake data, and uh, there's no increase in earthquakes in recent uh, times. It's, uh, there's argument for, for decrease in the frequency and intensity of large earthquakes over the, over the last century. And, um, and then we see this declining power of volcanoes with time. Uh, this is an interesting diagram. I just got finished drawing this. Uh, you can see uh, on the bottom those uh, big cubes. And down to the right of the big cubes, you see a little cube there called Mount St. Helens. And that's, that's the volume of material that was erupted in 1980 at Mount St. Helens. About one quarter of a cubic mile of new volcanic ash came out as Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18, 1980. It released the energy equivalent of 400 million tons of TNT blast energy in a nine-hour eruption, equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT uh, in the steam blast, 400 million tons of TNT explosion energy over the nine-hour period. Um, something like uh, 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs, an atomic bomb a second. Mount St. Helens just a small to average volcano from the standpoint of human experience. But you go back to the stratigraphic record, and Mount St. Helens is nothing, okay, totally eclipsed by these enormous volcanic explosions, such as the Crater Lake eruption, Mount Mazama, something like 17 cubic miles of ash that formed a Crater Lake. Mount Mazama erupted and then collapsed to form Crater Lake. Uh, and uh, Long Valley in, in uh, central eastern California, Long Valley eruption the, made the Bishop tough, about 150 cubic miles of ash. And then you go down there to see uh, two Yellowstone e explosions, and those were huge um, Yellowstone eruptions that formed the Yellowstone caldera, the Lava Creek Tough and the Huckleberry Ridge Tough. And uh, I was thinking how big those things were, but uh, we're sleuthing out even bigger ones. Uh, for example, that brushy basin member of the Middle Morrison Formation, which is probably a late flood deposit where the dinosaurs were buried, that one, just in the Rocky Mountain area, up a little bit into Canada, has something like 4,000 cubic miles of ash. Imagine the size of that eruption. Okay, what I'm showing you in this diagram is the declining power of volcanoes with time declining power of volcanoes with time. So if you look at any, uh, any volcanic uh, record objectively and put it in stratigraphic order, it's declining power with time. That's, that's what I'm seeing. Okay, well, the scripture to be remembered here, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, 3 through 6. To me, this, uh, this is really uh, important. Uh, the, uh, the text of 2 Peter chapter 3 says to remember, right? In the last days, mockers will come saying, what? All continues just as it was from the beginning. And uh, isn't that something spectacular? Uh, a prophecy about our day, and what does it say? That people will, uh, Peter is saying that all will continue just as it was from the beginning. Well, Peter goes on and he says, hey, they're willing the ignorant of this, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, uh, was deluged with water and perished. Uh, so this whole thing uh, is a, a very powerful passage. Uh, people are willing the ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Uh, probably a reference to creation week here. Peter is referring to day three of creation week when the, uh, and by fiat command, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, that the stars, right? And the earth was formed out of water uh, and by water. So the earth uh, and the continents appeared out of water, out of, the, out of the water that was over the whole ocean and by water. And so uh, that, is probably a reference to Creation Week 
And then Peter goes on to say, through which the world at that time, or the world that then was, being deluged with water or destroyed, being flooded with water. And so 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6 is talking about the flood. Okay, the flood, Noah's flood. The, and that, that was, that's spoken of in cosmic dimensions. And then he says, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire for the day of judgment. And uh, that's no local event either, okay? Uh, that's a global, uh, that's, a, that's actually a cosmic shakedown. Both the heavens and the earth will be melted with fervent heat. That's what Peter says. So anyway, uh, the scriptures to be remembered provide the framework in which to think about Steve. Strata, tectonics, erosion, volcanoes, exponential decline. Okay, let's do this again here. Okay, geology and the global flood. S-T-E-V-E, -E, right? Okay, the, the S is strata. Okay, and uh, you want to think about the strata forming process and sedimentation. And uh, everywhere, over 70% of the Earth's uh, uh, elevated surface, we see strata. And strata provide evidence of rapid deposition, every, almost virtually everywhere we look at them, not slow and gradual process. Geologists are now thinking about millions of years, still thinking about millions of years, but they put them in between str uh, strata. Strata don't provide a, a, uh, a, a conclusive proof for millions of years. The T stands for tectonics. And uh, the earth has been uh, uplifted and folded and faulted uh, and it's created the, the, the terrain of the planet, the basic terrain of the earth. The ocean floor is about 12,000 feet below sea level on the average and the continents are about 2,500 feet above sea level. We have these two distinct elevations on our planet and that allows our, our continents to be exposed. And so uh, in the wisdom of God, the tectonics has been used to express the elevations of the continents and create many of the mountain ranges that we see. And so tectonics and the collision of plates, especially along western North America, has created the Cordilleran uh, 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 fold belt and the, and the mountains along the western U.S., probably from plate subduction when Pacific Plate was shoved under western North America, and I believe during the time of the flood. The E stands for erosion. And boy, do we see erosion uh, all around us. Uh, large masses of, of material have been gouged out. 900 cubic miles just to make the Grand Canyon itself. And um, enormous areas. Uh, Grand Coulee here in Washington is what? A trench 50 miles long, uh, what? About three miles wide and 900 feet deep. Something like 50 cubic miles of rock was taken out by uh, Lake Missoula in Montana draining across uh, eastern Washington. So we see the evidence of, of massive erosion and giant lakes draining, uh, c cutting through the Colorado Plateau, creating uh, the, the Grand Canyon uh, and uh, the terrain on the, in, in the southwest. Okay, and the V stands for volcanoes. And so the volcanic process that we see all around us uh, topping off things. And of course, uh, the volcanoes provide uh, um, this uh, massive record of huge uh, uh, geologic uh, explosions and, uh, of course, uh, declining power of volcanoes with time. So that E last E reminds us of exponential decline. Okay, there you have uh, geology and the global flood. What's the, um, what's the thickness of that portion of the red wall limestone that has the nautiloids in it? And over what period of uniformitarian time is that supposed to have been accumulated? And are there any vertical nautiloids that you found in that okay, yeah, section? Yeah, boy, you're asking the, the good, que hard questions here. Okay, the, the thickness of that layer that was deposited uh, burying the nautiloids is seven feet thick two meters thick over that whole distance of about 150 miles, 200 miles from through Arizona into Nevada. And um, the nautiloids are, are uh, the fossils are right in a middle course band of that. I believe that's a slurry flow that took minutes to form. I believe it came out of Colorado as a giant seafloor mud flow. It flowed across Arizona at probably eight meters per second, roughly that velocity. It's fast enough to swallow up the nautiloids, vacuumed them up, and smothered them. 
and in the wake, it deposited the, uh, the nautiloid bed. But the main mass of sediment, about 25 cubic miles, slid into Nevada. And uh, as it slid into Nevada, it uh, caused the ocean to recoil, and the, layer, the thin layers above the nautiloids, did you see that in that picture? The thin uh, laminated beds and laminate, those I think are the back surge deposit from this major thing. So I've explained not just seven feet, but another hundred feet sitting on top of that, right? So over a hundred feet of sediment is uh, explainable in a single sedimentary event and the re recoil from that event. Okay, the, the surge, back surge from it. So um, that's what? One fourth, that's about one third of the thickness of the Redwall limestone can be explained in that kind of thing. And isn't that amazing? Okay, used to be we were thinking millions of years, so now looks like not. Okay, question. One more question about the nautiloids. Uh, I, it just wasn't clear to me the significance of their existence. Are you yeah, saying? By the way, vertical nautiloids. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll talk about. I'll come back to that. Right. I'm. I'm just not clear as to why it's so important that they were there, I mean, um, uh, and what the significance of that is. Would they not be there if they had formed so over millions of years? Okay, good, yeah. Good question. Okay. Yeah. What? Uh, um, the the answer is the the the, the fossils show orientation. They are, they are involved in a flow. They didn't fall to the bottom randomly like they in divide, uh, They all died of, uh, of old age, okay, and fell to the, to the calm and placid floor of the ocean. They have a dominant orientation, and that orientation shows flow. And the population of nautiloids is a bell-shaped curve. It's not old age fossils. It's a whole population it's of a living assemblage. And associated with it are corals and other things that were buried rapidly. And um, about one out of seven nautiloids is standing vertical in the bed. The bed froze so rapidly around them, they couldn't fall over flat. Okay, and, um, and, and other things about the nautiloid bed argue that it was a slurry flow. Okay, and I can model it on the slurry flow that buried the nautiloids. And so... Uh, that, that argues for a catastrophic event. And, uh, so, uh, Dave Sturm, um, your, your challenge was accepted. And uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, we've, we've found evidence of catastrophic burial of, of, of animals in, uh, in the limestone. So limestone sediment can be explained by rapid sedimentary process. Yes, your question. Um, so if an evolutionist walked up to Adam and Eve an hour after they were created, he would think they were in their early 20s probably. As the everything around them, God obviously created everything with the appearance of age in it, mm -hmm. starlight in motion toward the earth at that time already. Uh, so how can they argue that if a Christian understands that evolutionists have no explanation for the creation of the appearance of age of God into the world and in man? Mm -hmm. And so... If they, if they would, he didn't create them as babies and let them grow, which came first, the chicken or the egg, the chicken. So consequently, everything was created as whole in age, okay. and then we progressed from there. Would you agree with that? Uh, I endorse that view. I think there's a mature creation that God created very quickly on day one. Yeah. And if you looked at it, there would be trees planted in soil. It would look like the soil weathered from rock. Okay, and uh, they didn't, they, those, those trees didn't grow from seed, and that rock wasn't weathered from granite. Okay, and so yeah, I think you gotta, you gotta take that perspective. God is that big that he could make a full uh, functional creation. Wh why not do that? If you're a sovereign God, do that. R why would you want to evolve the cosmos by a slow process? And so that's, not the kind of God that's revealed in Second Peter chapter three, in Genesis chapter one, and talked about in Psalm chapter thirty-three uh, or one hundred four. Yeah. So uh, I was a theistic evolutionist at one time. You might have detected I was I was thinking evolution thoughts, and uh, no, it's not a stable position, is it? And it's not a God-honoring position to be a theistic evolutionist, because. Uh, 
God wants uh, us to think differently, doesn't he? He wants us to, to recognize uh, his, his word and his voice spoke creation into existence. Uh, some of my favorite verses, like uh, Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are made were not form, formed from things which do appear. And, uh, yeah, that, uh, God wants me to accept fiat creation by command. But then he gathered the waters together into the ocean basin, so there's process and fiat involved in creation. And uh, so let, uh, uh, let God uh, uh, tell us about it, because we weren't there. Angels probably saw it. They worshiped God. They saw the sovereign uh, power of God in the colossal event on day three. And, uh, and the foundations of the earth, and, and that would be wonderful. And so why, uh, that's a good way to think. That's a great way to think. And God doesn't want us to put junk food in our brain. Okay, and that, you, you got the idea. Question. Okay, where, where are we going next? Okay, right there. Yeah, it looks like you're having a lot of fun up there. I appreciate you. Okay. Um, uh, is it your opinion like the land masses originally were together and then they drifted apart? Is that yes. factual? Yeah, that's my, uh, and I think the main land masses were together during Noah's, uh, before Noah's flood. And, and the major ocean floor was subducted. The pre-flood ocean floor was subducted and the, the, uh, the tectonics that followed caused the continents to split apart. And you saw that simulation, that computer simulation that's been run using a a, uh, a viscosity code, code for the mantle, we can model the subduction of the pre-flood ocean floor. About 70% of the planet was subducted. The crust of the planet was subducted into the mantle. It created this uh, splitting of a, a supercontinent, uh, something like a supercontinent may have existed, not exactly that configuration, but something like that, and that, that formed the present Earth that we have. I don't think that continental sprint occurred during the days of Peleg. You know, in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. I think that, that's referring to the Tower of Babel division, people by language, and the disbursement of people over the earth, which had already been widely uh, distributed by continental sprint. <laughs> Question. <clears throat> yes, doctor. You mentioned that you demonstrated that the volcanoes are, getting, are losing strength. But yes. you never didn't expand on that. Do you find that significant? Do you right? Okay. Well, Peter gives me the framework in which to think. It was the flood last time. It's a fire next time, right? Okay. And uh, so as I think uh, of what's happened, is uh, tectonics has declined with time. Volcanoes have declined with time. The strata formation process, the area and the and the, the rate as as declined with time. So that's the perspective that I have uh, on the present. And then I look at the present, and that's what I see. Uh, I see physical uh, and statistical evidence that, that tectonics has declined with time. Volcanoes have declined with time. So I'm, I'm trying to get to give you the big picture that I as a geologist see. Question. Uh, you said that uh, due to the fact that the volcano, uh, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes are diminishing uh, through, you know, as time goes on, uh, obviously the Appalachian chain was formed way long time ago, and those stopped. The, those the eruptions on the east coast stopped, and that's why erosion has caused them to look like hills instead of mountains. Mm -hmm. And will the same thing happen to our uh, Rockies? Okay, well, uh, the, the, the Appalachians are uh, a mountain range that formed early or middle in the middle during the flood. They were beveled up. And the retreat of the floodwaters beveled off the top. And they beveled off the top of Appalachians uh, significantly. So they are low mountains. And they haven't been rising very much since then, okay, because they, the, that tectonic event was middle flood. Now, the, the later flood tectonic events made the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, the Cascade Range. Yeah, so we, we still see uplift, what? <laughs> in, uh, uh, in the mountains in California. California's not falling into the ocean, it's rising out of the ocean. And so uh, that's, what, that's what I see. Okay, so I hope that provides a good perspective. Question here. I'm just curious in terms of the, the 
tectonics. What was the acceleration and how fast did they move and what was resultant? Okay. Uh, In that simulation you saw of continental sprint, the, the continents split apart over that 300-day uh, period about one meter per second, which is a fast walk, okay? So a fast walk is, the, is continental sprint, okay? As the ocean floor split up open, forming the Atlantic Basin, the Indian Ocean, all around Arctic Ocean, swallowing up the Pacific Plate, as that, as that was uh, happening, um, hot water was in contact with magma on the seafloor. Can you imagine the fountains of the great deep, uh, great uh, uh, steam eruptions? Okay, uh, that could provide 40 days and 40 nights of rain, real easy. Okay, uh, you don't even need uh, much water vapor in the atmosphere; it can be recharged. Okay, uh, yeah. So uh, that's the way. That's the way I'm thinking. S- uh, Steve, so about uh, about a meter per second. Yes. Yeah. Just to follow up on your uh, volcanoes. I noticed that all the examples you gave, I think we're North America. Yes. Uh, does that mean we're in the most volatile uh, <laughs> continent? Or t- what about uh, Asia, like Indonesia? And- okay, uh, Toba on Sumatra is, a, is bigger than uh, Yellowstone, Lake Toba. And uh, if you're interested in following that, that's a, that's a big one. Um, yes, uh, and there, there are calderas elsewhere, but... Um, I'm responsible for the ones that, you know, are, are local, and so I'd like to talk to you about, you know, uh, Western United States if yeah. possible. But, yes, they're global, and, uh, you, um, and there are also big impact craters. looks like big objects have hit the continents in the big, big, big volcanic eruptions. Um, there are three kinds of eruptions, nozzle eruptions like Mount St. Helens from a central conduit or stock. There's a second kind of eruption that's an unzipping around a circle or an ellipse. That's called a, uh, a caldera or a ring fissure eruption. Ring fissures are like what made Crater Lake, a small version, big version like made Long Valley, California, or Yellowstone. And then there, there is a new style of volcano that's being recognized. It's called linear fissure array, linear fissure array volcanoes. And uh, we think that the Morrison Formation, with all the dinosaur inside of it, that volcanic ash layer, brushy basin member, was erupted from linear fissures in Southern California going down into Mexico. Uh, from the magma that was associated with the granite associated with the Sierra Nevada. And so we think of big linear fissure arrays uh, erupting. And those would be cl- so colossal you could not imagine. I think that's associated with the rapid plate tectonics and the recoil of the plates and, and the post flood period. One uh, last wrap up question before we take a break. Yes. Uh, you've been involved in this uh, discipline, I think, for what, 35 years or so. Uh, have you seen much of a movement of the secular geologist towards your way of thinking? Okay. Let me tell you, uh, let me tell you about University of Washington in 1966. I sat down in an office and the, and the, uh, uh, the advisor, the geology advisor, said to me, a freshman, if you continue to, th- uh, it was 1968, so three years after I enrolled, so I'd be a freshman, sophomore, junior, I'd be in about in the junior year. He said, if you continue to think this way, you'll be of no value as a geologist. <laughs> and uh, you will not get a job. And so uh, w- uh, think about thinking differently about this catastrophous thinking that you have going on in your brain. He, uh, uh, that was uh, a, a professor at University of Washington said that to me, a young uh, geology student. Uh, what happened? Over the period since then, okay, 40 years, a uh, little more than 40 years, what's happened? Geology has become um, infused with this understanding of catastrophe. Repeatedly, in, in, in many disciplines now, catastrophe is there. Catastrophic process is there. And so I am just a full-blown catastrophist. I'm, I'm not a neo-catastrophist. I don't have a little bit of, <laughs> of uniformitarianism and millions of years in cat- cat- catastrophic process. I just believe that catastrophic process is there. And I, and I believe the biblical framework gives me the, uh, the, the way to organize my thinking. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, well, let's thank Steve for his contribution. Thank you.